Next, I'll introduce our first speaker, Max Welling. Max is a professor and research chair at the University of Amsterdam, a VP of technology at Qualcomm, and a senior fellow at CIFAR. He has made fundamental contributions to generative models, deep learning, and Bayesian inference. Even people new to generative modeling are likely familiar with many of Max's papers, like autoencoding variational Bayes from ICLR 2014, which introduced us all to variational autoencoders, which are now an extremely popular class of generative models. Recently, he has also published papers on invertible representations and causal models, so we're very excited for what might come next. Welcome, Max. We're delighted to have you. Thank you very much, Adam. All right, so thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here and uh, give this presentation for your workshop. Um, yeah, so I'll be talking about um, generative modeling and how to uh, combine them with the typical sort of deep learning discriminative models. Um, so let's get started. So as an overview, uh, first I'll talk a little bit about sort of a high level introduction about how I view generative modeling and versus discriminative modeling and why it's a good idea to try to combine them. Then I'll talk into a little bit more detail about what VAEs are, what flows are, and then actually um, as a somewhat more recent research idea, um, how we can combine these two ideas into what we call survey flows. So basically they are two sides of the same coin and there's a sort of unifying framework to consider them both in. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about my sort of um, philosophy on how we should combine or look at in inverse modeling uh, and how to combine that with generative modeling um, in basically which a, a scheme which you call neural augmentation where this is a hybrid scheme where both generative modeling as well as discriminative modeling sort of work together. Um, okay, so uh, let me just go back to the, maybe the first thing you need to learn about machine learning or you already know about machine learning, which is the sort of the fundamental equation of machine learning that says inductive biases plus data make predictions. Um, like here, so they're sort of on a scale and for certain problems, uh, you have a lot of inductive bias um, and not so much data, um, and you need to do a good job of figuring out what the world looks like. In the other extreme, uh, you might have a lot of data and you don't need to do a very good job in, in, in your inductive biases, which means you can just do very flexible modeling with lots and lots of parameters and you can let the data speak. On one end of the extreme, uh, we have deep learning and discriminative models, uh, like if, for instance, natural language processing and, 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 and uh, image uh, analysis and all these kinds of things. On the other side of the spectrum, um, you know, you might, you know, have things where you want to use Bayesian networks or generative models. Um, you might care about out of domain generalization because, you know, in this particular domain, you might have data, but then if you go out of that, out of your domain, you might have very few data or not, no data. Um, and on that, side of the equation, it's uh, very good to have, uh, to think very hard about your, your generative models and the data gener generative process. So a gen discriminative model is basically the inverse of what everybody else in the sciences does. Um, you take on your raw data, which is your, the pixels of your image or the sound, the audio in your microphone, and you map it through some kind of very complex, uh, non-interpretable uh, map, iterative map. Uh, that then tries to predict properties of the input, like you know what's the object that you that you see in the in the image, or what what words are being spoken by this this audio that hits my microphone. Um, and of course, we train these models by backpropagation. Um, and then there is a sort of a divide, somewhat a schism, somewhat in the community, which says um, basically everything we would ever need is deep learning, which is bottom up processes where we take in raw data and we push them through layers and layers of analysis and we basically predict things about the world. And as we scale our compute and as we scale our data sets, um, that will be enough. And some circumstantial evidence for that is maybe GPT-3, which is basically a massive amount of data and a massive amount of compute thrown at a task. And then uh, it, it, you know, it produces amazing sort of coherent um, sort of text. Um, the other side uh, will say, no, 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 that will not ever be enough. There's an exponential number of things that you can encounter in the world. Uh, you really need to understand something about the generative and the causal structure of the world, or you need to be able to reason about the world. 
Um, and let, but let's say that will be the Spock side of the sort of the debate. Now, uh, to give you one example of something that a human can do wonderfully well and a computer uh, cannot do at all, uh, including GPT-3, um, is generalization from very few examples. And of course, in the computer vision community, this is a very well-known problem. So you, I give you one example of something that you may or may not have seen. And then I can sort of query you with a bunch of test samples. Um, and you will be able to figure out that, uh, you know, these two are indeed uh, sort of examples of this water bear. Um, even though this might actually look quite different in color and even like in shape. But you know something about how the world works, you know something about what legs are, you know something about the snout thing, and you can put things together and say, well, you know, highly likely this would also be an example of it. And the way we do that uh, is we, we embed a single image into sort of an ocean of background knowledge, um, such as, you know, the laws of physics. You could sort of even imagine how this little creature would walk or swim or whatever. When you look at it, uh, about you have ideas about causality, about biology, um, and you know maybe less important in this particular example, psychology and sociology. Um, and of course, causality is a really important problem. I won't be talking about it very much here, um, but causality plays a very important role in um, understanding the world and also making sure that you can generalize away from things that you have learned your model on, right? So without an understanding of cause and effect, it's very hard to make optimal decisions. It's also very hard to you know, generalize out of context. And uh, Judea Pearl you know, has sort of, I'm quoting him here, said something like, this ingredient should allow computer systems to choreograph a parsimonious and modular representation of their environment, interrogate that representation, distort it through active imagination, and finally answer what if kind of questions, right? So we can, to sort of summarize that, we can imagine an image of a blue elephant cycling on the moon, uh, where that would never be something that we would ever see. We can only imagine it. It's built out of modules, like an elephant and a bicycle, bicycle and the moon, etc. cetera. Um, we can manipulate that in our minds. Uh, we can play the video and sort of ask, well, what if, you know, it hits a stone or it, or it drives into a, a va you know, some kind of uh, whatever valley or something like that, right? So we can, we can do all these kinds of things in our mind, which is kind of the power of generative models because we use the laws of physics and causality to, to play out these movies. And of course that's related to something that basically almost all of the scientists uh, use, which is simulators and ordinary or partial differential equations uh, to basically encode all of their knowledge about the world into their models. So they, they really think about how is the data that I'm observing being generated, right? So you can think of two galaxies that are colliding and you know under the laws of physics, and gravity, how do the stars sort of interact? Uh, simulators about uh, earthquakes in California, simulators about how the heart functions, simulators about the weather, et cetera, et cetera, right? So these are all PDEs and all sorts of simulators. In the, in the machine learning community, before the deep learning era, let's say, uh, we were thinking in this direction too a lot, which we were talking about graphical models, um, and graphical models are an instance of, you know, how you probabilistically generate data. These days, uh, we would call them probabilistic programs, I think, which is more like a computer language to generate um, sort of, you know, fake data, if you want. Um, now, of course, we all know about, you know, the various brands of, uh, of generative models. Uh, just to make sure I, I, I don't skip this one, I'll just say a few words about generative adversarial networks. Um, they are amazing, um, as was already mentioned, at generating high quality uh, images. Uh, so here, all but one of these images is actually a sort of artificial fake image generated by a GAN. And the way they do it is by basically having some generator that generates an image and then having a discriminator that tries to figure out whether what it sees is either a true image from the data set or a generated fake image from the generator and both try to become better and play this kind of arms race so that they get better. So in this particular um, set, this is the generated image. And if you would have asked me, I don't know, 10 or 20 years ago, 
would we ever build models that would generate images that are this realistic? I would probably have said no. So uh, this is a, quite an accomplishment, I would think. So there's another set of models um, that I've been working with quite a bit, and they're related to something that we called uh, sort of forward and inverse models, which are also very popular in the sciences. And um, what they do is they take some latent quantity of interest. Um, so let's say a high quality image of something. And we imagine that there is some kind of channel over which this data gets corrupted until it hits our sort of sensors. So this could be like a blurred, this is a blurry version of this. Um, and it's kind of a, some kind of channel, a noisy channel that it goes through um, that sort of distorts this particular input. And then our task is to look at these observations and figure out, you know, how the world really looks like. I mean, this is like the overall goal of science, right? So we see things that are incomplete that we try to reconstruct, you know, the, the, all the details of the world. Now that's very, uh, so we call this the forward model and this the inverse model. Um, and that's very much related to the variation autoencoder. So in a variation autoencoder, we also have, you know, our sensors, which are X, the observations on our sensors. We push them through an encoder distribution, which is the probability of some latent variable Z, which are unobserved given this input. And then uh, typically we think of Z as a lower dimensional space with abstract number Z. Uh, but in this particular case, it is basically this ground truth image of an eight that I, I'm not observing, but I'm trying to reconstruct. So that's that's much more related um, to this kind of forward and inverse modeling in the sciences, right? And then there's a decoder, which takes this kind of latent thing and sort of models the actual generation process and going from the high resolution image to the things that we actually observe on our sensors. And how are these two related? So how is the, for, the discriminative model um, related to the generative model. Um, and that's by something that you also know at your Statistics 101 class, uh, from your Statistics 101 class, which is Bayes' rule, right? So in Bayes' rule, we relate the probability in one direction, which is the probability of class given data, um, to the probability, this is the discriminative model, to the generative model, which is the probability of the data given the class. And of course, you need these two objects, the prior of a class and the normalization comes and probability of data to connect these two things together. But in the generative modeling case, we parameterize this object and in the, dis and in the sort of discriminative modeling case, we parameterize this object, let's say with a deep learning model. Okay, so the pros and the cons of these two frameworks, um, I would say are the white box uh, approach is it's data efficient. Uh, because you use basically your expert knowledge in this generative process, let's say the laws of physics. It's highly interpretable because all these, you know, variables that you put, you know, let's say in, 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 in these models mean something in the real world. And it's typically better, it, it's better at a generalization because these, these physical rules and these causal rules, they, they apply not just in the context in which you learned your model, but they will also apply out of context in let's say another country or in another context. Now the black box um, is far more flexible. Um, so you don't have to rely on the human imagination as much. There's many problems like modeling the internet where it's just impossible to model all the details, all the detailed sort of interactions that will take place. And it's much better to rely on data uh, to discover all of these thousands of patterns. Um, it's therefore in many cases, it's also far more accurate in making predictions. And that's also true because you train the model in the direction that you're using it. You want to use a model to make the type of predictions exactly the way you've trained the model. Where in the white box approach, you would have to need Bayes rule to invert your model. And also the predictions are fast, right? Because you don't need that Bayes rule. Now in general, I would argue both have pros and cons, um, but I think we want to combine the strengths of both of these modeling paradigms. So what's the state uh, basically in generative modeling? I would say um, GANs uh, are perhaps the biggest field at this point. And then there's VAEs and flows, which are trailing. And so one of the things I will try to do today is to, if I, so would be to, if I, what if I would join these two bubbles together, maybe they become competitive with GANs. Uh, 
Okay, so first let me give you a little bit of detail on the VAE. Um, so what is a VAE? A VAE basically says if I I have some and so some decoder model that is the way uh, that simulates how the data gets generated. So this could in fact be a simulator like this. Um, I have some latent variables p of z and maybe some class labels. I generate them from from prior and then push them through my neural net or my simulator. And, um, and then I get sort of simulated observations on my sensor data. So let's say an image of an echocardiogram or something like that. That's the probability of X, the image given Z and Y. Now there's also the inverse model that's, that you need in order to train this model. You can, you can view this as an instance of expectation maximization, a statistical tool to train, let's say this model P. And in order to train it, you need the inverse of P. Um, and that we will model now with a um, with an encoder model, where you stick in, let's say, the data point X, and again you go through a neural net. You produce, let's say, a mean and a standard deviation, the parameters of a, that's the, that are the parameters of a normal distribution, and that from that you you then generate your latent variable Z, and perhaps also your latent variable Y, uh, the class label, right? So with this object, you can, you can actually train this object, but you can also view it reverse, which is if I'm actually interested in this object, which is actually a, a discriminative model, right? Because here I take my image and I produce the class label. I might just be interested in this thing here. Now having this alongside of it can help me because here I can stick in my expert knowledge. This is the data generating process. So here I can stick in all the information that I get from this by talking to the scientists and the doctors and whatever to get this model. And then this model is regularized to try to be close to the inverse of this model. And that way it sort of encodes a lot of the information in here. Um, now the objective that we use in more detail is basically the KL divergence between the encoder times the, distrib the empirical distribution over X with the sort of the prior over Z and then the decoder model. And if you decompose that, you find two terms. And the first term says is the KL between the empirical distribution and the marginal model distribution, which is satisfied if these two are equal. I guess you don't want them to be completely equal because then you're overfitting. And the other one is saying, well, the expected KL over the data between the Q posterior, the, the approximate posterior and the true posterior. And that is true and satisfied when Q is actually equal, you know, satisfies Bayes rules. And of course that makes a lot of sense too because Q needs to be the inverse of P. And this is what we mean by that. Okay, so that's the VAE. Um, let me also remind you of normalizing flows. So a normalizing flow is um, basically a deterministic invertible transformation or reparameterization of your random variables. So X here is your original random variables that you're interested in. Z are some latent rep, you know, um, random variables, maybe distributed by a normal distribution. And then there is this, uh, you have this map Z of X, and then you need to compute this Jacobian, which is this sort of matrix of derivatives between Z and X compute the determinant, take the absolute value, and then in this case, take the log. So that's your log to Jacobian that you need to compute. Now, this is very nice because um, you now have a direct sort of noiseless uh, expression of your likelihood. But of course, the disadvantage is that the number of variables here and here need to be the same. And also related to that is that the map from X to Z, ZX, has to be an invertible map. And it's not always easy to, I mean, the set of invertible maps is smaller clearly than the set of any maps that we use in neural networks. But it's a very powerful tool uh, by these authors. Um, and um, you can also stack it, which is also very interesting, of course. So you can make it deep. And the way you do that is you, you sort of have multiple of these uh, sort of transformations. You get multiple of these Jacobians that you then, because the log here, you add up. And then you have a transformation between X and sort of the initial distribution. And that allows you to um, sort of to, you know, to make these individual maps easier to manage um, and to have more powerful transformations. Okay, so then um, if we then look at these two kind of frameworks, um, we have again written out here the 
log probability x for the flow. And here's the elbow, which I hope everybody is familiar with, but written out in a slightly sort of different strange way, which is a bound on the marginal likelihood over x, which is the expected value of the log p of z. This is not written here as the p of x given z, which is what you typically see here, but it's the expected value over the encoder q of log p of z. And then there is this ratio term here, the, the expected value over q of the log of px given z divided by qz given x. If you look at these two terms, they sort of, you know, you can sort of match terms. And it's indeed true that this term, because it's stochastic and here it's deterministic, but this term takes the place of the sort of Jacobian or log Jacobian that we see here. And now what the cool thing is, uh, you can now start to combine these two and stack them in arbitrary sort of, uh, sort of ways. Um, and the way you can now compute the uh, sort of likelihood of this joint model is as follows. So you start with some data, some prior over Z and some transformations F. Um, and F are either deterministic or they are stochastic. And um, so we want to compute the likelihood. And then uh, we iterate over T. Um, if F is bijective, so we can do our normalizing flow, we basically say Z is the inverse F of X, so it's a deterministic step. And then as we all know, we then have to compute this term here, the log Jacobian in order to compute the contribution of that F to the likelihood. And if it's stochastic, uh, you draw one single sample from that Q and then you log this term here uh, for that Z and you add it to the stack of Vs and in the end you add all the Vs up. So now this opens up the possibility of combining flow terms as well as um, sort of VAE terms together in one formalism. So it's actually somewhat of a unifying framework, uh, which is nice. And uh, uh, sort of Dietrich Nielsen, who is the sort of the main brain behind this, uh, together with uh, two students of mine. Um, so Dietrich is uh, in the TU Denmark. Um, so they, uh, so that you can also now generalize this to surjections. Um, and so how does this work? So the the flow is a map like this, where you know every point is mapped to one single point between Z and X. It has to be invertible and the dimensions have to match. Now the VAE is much more flexible because the number of points here and here do not have to match. And also because all of these maps are probabilistic, you know, you can take one points to multiple points in both directions. However, you can also think about surjections. Now let's say um, if we go from X to, uh, yeah, from Z to X here in this particular case, right? Then um, we get down in dimensionality. So we get from more latent variable Z, we get to fewer observed observer variables X. Um, and then of course, if we, have, if we have to go in the opposite direction, we have to use a stochastic map because now we have to, from this point, we have with the probability, you know, P, we have to reach this point and with the probability one minus P, we have to go to the other point. And you can also do this in the other direction. And of course, in flows, people have already been playing with this idea in many settings, right? We have this, this called thing called generative slicing, where you say the X values get mapped to a sector in latent space. And then there is another sector here, uh, which we sort of stochastically generate, right? And the opposite you can also do, which is inference slicing, where, um, you know, basically, Again, when you generate X, one part is deterministic and the other part is stochastic from a probability distribution. And things like pooling operations um, also fall in this category. And uh, the framework is very sort of flexible. So you can sort of say, okay, for a projective, we have two Fs. Uh, we, for, for the likelihood contribution, we compute this log determinant and we don't make any error. So this is an exact computation. For stochastic, we know we have two, you know, a probabilistic encoder and a decoder. Um, we have this term that we need to pick up from the elbow, uh, and we make act, we do actually make an error um, because it's a bound, which is equal to this. And then for these two surject, surject, surjections, um, you know, one is a deterministic map in the in the opposite direction. You need a stochastic map, um, and then you can take limits and actually compute the contributions uh, that you need to add to the likelihood.
And for one of them, it's exact. You don't make an error. For the other one, it's a bound, and you do make an error. But anyway, the, one, the thing I want to point out that this is a very general framework, and there's also code to, uh, to run these kinds of things. And sort of maybe you should stop thinking about flows and VAEs, but you should think of them as basically uh, one and the same thing, but where you sort of mix, you either have to choose whether you do things probabilistically or sort of deterministically. Okay, so the next topic um, I wanted to go into a little bit. Um, I'm not sure how much time I still have, but uh, I have not heard a sign yet, so I'll just go into this a little bit, um, which is neural augmentation. So neural augmentation, um, so, so let's, let's look at the VAE again. So in the VAE we have, we start from X and we have an encoder distribution to get to P of Z given X. And then we have a decoder which says, okay, start from a prior P of Z and then have a P of X given Z going to you know, X prime. And then we have a loss function which says, make the difference between X prime and X as small as possible. So we can extend this idea to say, well, go from X to the first Z1 and then from Z1, use your generative model to reconstruct X, which is sort of similar to this, right? This sort of an intermediate result. Compare this with the input, look at the difference in some way, and then push this difference to the next layer, including your Z1 and including this difference. And now do another computation. Again, hopefully you improve. So you again, reconstruct X, compare, have a difference and push it through. And in the end, you hope that this iteratively improves. And in the end, uh, sort of, uh, you know, that, that's the actual latent variable, the reconstruction that you're now interested in. And of course, there's also a generative model, which puts a prior on the first one and then has sort of a, a chain on the latent space of decoder um, sort of distributions to decode Z and then from Z back to X. Okay, so that's the sort of overall idea. Um, we're gonna apply this to a couple of problems. One is in astronomy. Here's our latent image of the sky. We observe things in the Fourier domain. In fact, we observe things very sparsely in the Fourier domain. And if we do just an inverse Fourier transform, we get this ugly image. And we want to use learning to go back to, you know, to do inverse modeling and find this particular image. Uh, same problem, almost identical in MRI. You also measure sparse measurements in the Fourier domain and you want to reconstruct. Um, there's a, we also looked at error correction decoding. In error correction decoding, you take sort of uh, an image um, and you add some sort of redundant bits um, and then you send them through a noisy channel, you get noisy bits and then you can sort of use error correction decoding to uh, correct the mistakes that you've been making. So in the classical way to handle this um, is by either doing gradient descent uh, where you have your sort of, this is your, your model that generates the observations given the latent variable X and you have some prior over what you expect in terms of latent variables and then you do gradient descent on this thing. Other, other models are like, like belief propagation uh, to try to reconstruct something, like especially in the case of error correction decoding, this is very popular. Um, anyway, it's typically an iterative algorithm that tries to iter iteratively compute something based on some kind of graphical model of the world, some kind of generative model of the world. That a deep learning solution is very different. You collect a huge amount of data, right? And then X, Y pairs, and then you just train a net that tries to reconstruct X from Y, right? So here's like a noisy image and here's a U net and you try to sort of reconstruct maybe the image um, as, as it's cleaned up. Now the problem is that this architecture knows absolutely nothing about the, uh, the generative model of the world. All of that information is in the data set. So you would love to give this, this model more information about what the actual channel looks like that goes from X to Y. And that's kind of this idea, sort of you unroll an iterative optimization scheme and interpret that as an RNN. So this could be your belief propagation or your, your, uh, your uh, gradient descent. You add some, some memory states to this problem. And then you train a deep neural net not to actually you know, pre you know, predict it, the, the signal completely, but typically you try to predict the mistake that's being made by the, it, by the engineering solution. So there is some engineering backbone, iterative classical signal processing solution that gives you a good estimate, but the neural network is trying to correct it and improve it, right? And it always uses this, this generative model P of Y sort of in, 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 in the guts of the algorithm. Um, 
Um, so here's a so yep. five minutes left. Five minutes, yeah, that's perfect. Um, so here's an example of a, sort of a nonlinear Kalman filter. This is a chaotic uh, sort of dynamical system. If you can just use a, you know, it's, it's a Kalman filter structure, so you can use a graph neural net to train it. Uh, you get something like this. Um, it doesn't work very well if you don't see a lot of data, but as you see more and more data, it will do better. You can do the Kalman smoother sort of equation, uh, different versions of it. Of course, they don't learn anything, ver you know, so they just stay, stay the same. Um, but in the case of few data points, they do better. And then there's these hybrid solutions, which actually do better than either of these other solutions at all data regimes. Uh, we also looked at fast MRI. So we had some models that we entered in the fast MRI challenge and we won one of the tracks uh, to reconstruct a MRI image from sort of a low sampled, subsampled sort of Fourier measurement set. And also we've looked at error correction decoding problems. Again, we have some kind of belief propagation running in the, in the background uh, to do the error correction decoding, but we also trained a graph neural net on a factor graph to compute corrections for the belief propagation algorithm so that after T steps of decoding, it would get the optimal result. And at the end, there's a loss function and you sort of back propagate through the whole chain. And then um, if you look at that, so we looked at a bursty channel, uh, which is a channel of data where sometimes the noise uh, increases. And as you increase the burstiness of the noise, the channel model is wrong. And sort of the, the learned model can compensate for that very nicely. Here's the error rate and here's the, the noise uh, variance. Even compared to extremely competitive algorithms like the LDPC code and the LDPC, the bursty models that are actually being used, um, it, it performs quite a bit better in a realistic situation that you don't know precisely what the channel looks like. Okay, so to conclude, um, generative, um, I believe generative model and causal modeling are essential for you know making the next step in AI. So I, I'm totally fascinated by deep learning and I think they might still go quite far, but it's hard for me to believe that they will go all the way to being as good and efficient with data as humans are. Um, and so I think we need something like that to incorporate in our modeling. So I've argued that uh, VAEs and, and normalizing flows are basically closely related. I would say almost two sides of the same coin. We, we sort of generalize this in survey flows with surjections and that's sort of a kind of a nice unified framework to model in. Um, so um, yeah, to, so to perform inference um, in models to build encoders, I've argued that we want to embed the generative model in these encoders, not just train from data, but actually embed the generative channel into the encoder models. And neural augmentation is kind of the term that I use to, to combine this generative and discriminative modeling um, together. Okay, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, and then maybe we can open up the floor for some questions. Wonderful. Uh, so for the audience, you can click on the raise hand button and uh, then I can unmute you for your questions or you could type them into the Q&A box. Um, I, have, I have a quick question of my own. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, so in, in these frameworks, there is always a, a pixel reconstruction objective hmm. in, in the image case. And we're, so we're trying to generate pixel perfect images. And I'm wondering if there's maybe a way around that or, or if you're interested in a way around that just because of maybe the, the very difficult problem of reproducing such high frequency signals. Yeah, I think we, we have done a little bit of work in this direction. Um, I agree that sort of the assumption is that in the decoder, there is at some point typically sort of you have a model and then the model says, uh, you know, for every pixel have an independent uh, sort of a no noise distribution. And so the noise for the pixels is then independent and that's probably not a very good model. So we have, we have looked at actually using flows to model correlated noise on the pixels. Um, and that, that does very interesting things. It, it does work a little bit better. Um, and so, yeah, so I think, I think there is still some work to do, but you can sort of imagine that you can build a more sophisticated decoder model that instead of generating uh, sort of the parameters of a 
probability distribution that's factorized over your your uh, pixels, you can think of it as you know generating noise higher up and then having some normalizing flow transformation that correlates the you know the the noise before it generates the the pixels. So we've got a question from Chris Atkinson in the audience. Hello, I hope my sound is working. Yes, yep. it does. Uh, so you put forward one way to solve optimization problems. Another way to solve optimization problems over time is, is that the forward model works forward in time. And then there is a backwards process that propagates cost information in the form of value functions. And I'm trying to understand what the relationship is between these two views of how to do optimization, one of which propagates value functions backwards in time, and the other which yeah. somehow creates an inverse model. Actually, that's a very... The second question, which you, you did address, but I'm not sure I understood is, for example, in robotics, uh, you have to regularize the inverse model because there, there are many uh, possible inverses and somehow you have to inject a choice. Yeah, yeah. So, um, okay, so about the first thing, uh, that's, that's a very interesting question. Um, and I, so, so the first thing is I, I didn't quite use it in this talk, uh, this framework for optimization, but it certainly applies to optimization. So you can certainly think about um, sort of saying I have an optimization problem and um, let's say I have some classical optimizer that iterates, that's an iterative solution that tries to find a solution. Can I now train sort of a neural network that sort of nudges and changes the solution a little bit, which, which you could call a policy, right? Now, the policy, so uh, that would be fine, but then if for every solution, it's actually quite expensive to figure out how good that solution is, right? Then it is useful to have a value function because the value function will then tell you very quickly, you know, an estimate of how good that particular solution is. And you can sort of use that value function then to also guide that search process. And that's of course AlphaGo or alpha zero or whatever is an, is a prime example of something like that, right? So where you have a policy to search your, you know, to, to, to figure out how to search in your tree in the, in the breadth. And then, you know, you go to a certain point and then it's actually very expensive to figure out, you know, what the value of your position is. And so then there is a value function estimator that basically says, okay, how good is this? You know, how, what's the likelihood of actually winning from this particular position? Um, so I think that's how these, think of one of them as a surrogate function to try to figure out what the value or, or, the, or the cost is of the objective is, and the policy as helping you navigate, you know, which, which moves to make um, in, in the space. Um, and, and, that's, and it's related to this if, if the policy and the value function both become sort of neural enhanced in some sense around some classical optimization solution. The other one, um, yeah, so that's a classical question about how to regularize solutions. Um, and I would say, um, now there is of course, the, in the classical way of doing things, you have a, you have a prior, um, right? So here, there's this prior um, that, that will help you sort of choose between things. Now in the sort of neural augmentation space, the prior explicitly has disappeared, but it's sort of been embedded, you know, in this whole sort of neural net because the neural net is trained on a whole lot of examples. Implicitly, it encodes the information about what is a good solution and what is a bad solution that traditionally the prior sort of takes on, right? But it's sort of more entangled into this thing. So it, it will guide you towards a solution that you then pick and that prior information, that sort of choice, with which one is a better one, even though two of them might ex both explain the data equally well, is encoded into this neural net. Thank you very much, Max, for the wonderful talk and for answering the questions. Um, All right. Just so everyone knows the, the talks will be on available on YouTube later, so you can rewatch and inspect all of the details. All right, thank you very much.